All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. I'm coming to you from Seattle today. Happy to, to be here. So thanks for joining. And we will be talking about personalizing content using taxonomy. The objectives of today. First of all, we want to understand what personalization is and why it's important. It might seem somewhat obvious, but there are some nuances that we will talk about. We're going to look at various use cases for personalization when it comes to delivering content specifically. We'll define taxonomy specifically for product content or technical content as opposed to other taxonomies that you may be involved with. And then we'll learn how to use taxonomy specifically for personalization. So those are the objectives that we're going to try and cover today. Diving in, what is personalization? Well, if you look it up online on Google, you'll get something like this. The action of designing or producing something to meet someone's individual requirements. That's pretty close. That's, that's the best definition I could find that was the most relevant. But I'd like to suggest something even uh, more closely related to what we do. The act of adding context and relevance to information so users can find it more quickly, relate to it, and use it immediately to make more informed decisions. This is a definition that I like to use for personalization of content. So why should we care? Well, a CIDM survey found that the three most common customer demands with regards to content include customized or personalized content. So customers clearly care about it. They are asking for it and they want it. And according to TMG, 78% of consumers believe that organizations who provide custom content are interested in building good relationships with them. That's a really important thing. And that is a way in which we can build trust in our brands using our content. Now, when we look at the, the business value of content or we look at the value chain, if we start in the left, we obviously want to have available and useful content. We want it to be out there for people. But it's not until we start making it findable that we start adding business value. When we make it more engaging, we add even more business value. And we can do both of these things through personalized content. So we really want to start driving the value of our content within our businesses, and we can use personalization to do that. Now, it's important to note that while we're driving the value, we also want to be reducing the effort and spending. And we know that the biggest effort is typically a human effort. And in order to reduce that effort, we require technology. And when we use technology, we need to provide that technology with a predictable way of understanding the world, and we can do that using taxonomy. So I want to talk about the four R's of personalization. The first is your platform needs to recognize the user. So in order to personalize, the very first step is the platform must recognize who they're personalizing to. And they can do that in many ways. So your platform probably has a user profile. You may ask the user to opt into certain things. You may ask the user to state certain things about him or herself. Or you may just use the content that comes from your authentication system. But in some way, your platform must recognize the user. Secondly, the platform needs to remember not only who the user is, but what the user has done. So what clicks did they make before they got to where they currently are? If your system can remember the browsing behavior, the navigation, any implicit interests that are being shown through their actions, then you're more likely to hit the nail on the head when you personalize content to them. Now, when your system recognizes and remembers you can then 
recommend content that is specific to that particular user. And so adding recommendations is a great way to personalize content and it adds to the customer experience. Likewise, adding relevance to the search experience is another great way to add personalization. And this is something that requires, again, your platform, your platform's ability to recognize and remember who it is that's doing the search. So showing that in just a, a little bit of a different way, your platform must recognize and remember. And your platform will do that using maybe your CRM tool, maybe the SSO profile or other authentication method. You might have explicit preferences where you actually have them state what they prefer. You might look at prior behavior and you might even look at location. And there are probably many other things that your system could look at. And then what your customer gets is they get the relevant content and the recommendations that they need. And this comes in the form of entitlements and preferences. So it could be uh, content that's restricted to a certain role, and so they only get the content that is applicable to them based on their role. Uh, it could come in the form of search behavior and sort of weighting the search results based on who they are. There are a lot of things that you could do. You could send content types based on what they prefer. You could recommend other content based on where they've browsed already. Personalized topic collections are great, product announcements, call to actions that are really targeted to a specific user. These are all ways to personalize your content. So let's look at some specific use cases. So we know that if somebody is logged in and they've selected what their role is, then it's pretty easy to say, okay, well, this person's a developer, so I'll give them developer content. But let's say you don't want them to have to log in. There's another way to do it, and this particular company did a beautiful job of really segmenting their web property by role. And so they asked people to self-select. They knew their personas very, very well. They had very specific personas, and they anticipated that only these four types of people would be interested in coming into this page. And so they asked the user to self-select without even having to log in. What this did is this gave them an ability to then provide role-based navigation. So the system administrator comes in, and now we have content that is specific for the system administrator. And so the, the blue links that you see at the bottom, that's the content that the system is recommending, this platform is recommending to this person who is, has self-selected as a system administrator. And taking it one step further, they provided this Metro map, which is a really great way to personalize an experience. If you look at the, the green line across, that kind of goes from left to right, we want to move obviously from left to right along that path. And right now this person is at prepare for the move. And so the content in the vertical green line, that's the content that she needs to dive into right now. Once she finishes all that, then she can move over to the right, which would be the next section, move code. And then she can go along that learning path. But this is a way to kind of personalize the learning by creating very specific paths, not just for her as a system admin, but for her as a system admin who happens to be at this very point in the customer journey. All right, how do we do all this? Well, we do it with a foundation of using a taxonomy. Without a taxonomy, this is a really, really difficult ask. Could it be done? I suppose it could. But a taxonomy lays the foundation to help us do all of this personalization of product content. So what's a taxonomy? Well, the scientific definition is the science or technique of classification or a classification into ordered categories. That's the, the science version. For content, 
We want our taxonomy to support common user scenarios, so support the things that our users are trying to do. We definitely want to be able to enable security and entitlements. We want to be able to restrict content based on user role um, or other characteristics of the user that we want to provide entitlements for. A common taxonomy can actually bridge your content silos when the same taxonomy is used across multiple organizations. So if you're in a large, large company and you have a taxonomy and every other team has a different taxonomy, that's not really helping you bridge your content silos. If you can come together and create a common taxonomy, that's a great way of governing your content and bridging those silos. Taxonomy, of course, enables personalized preferences and recommendations, as we've talked about already and we'll talk about a bit more. Taxonomy can also support reuse of micro-content, and by micro-content, I mean little bits of content, so like sentences or chunks of content that might be in your help but then are reused in, in product help or reused in a walkthrough or reused in marketing blasts out to your customers. And of course, the taxonomy can feed your machines, whether it's AI, chatbots, uh, ML, whatever it is you're doing. Having a predictable structure and hierarchy is always beneficial to feeding your, your machines. So what exactly is taxonomy for technical documentation or product documentation? It's really just a hierarchical list of terms representing the subject and, and categories that you have within your product content. So think of it like a filing strategy. If I am going to set up a filing cabinet, I want to understand how I'm going to then file my stuff into the different folders. So if I'm setting it up for my family, I might set it up by my family members' names first, and then within that have medical and school and sports and on and on. Or I may decide it makes more sense to set up a medical folder, a school folder, a sports folder, and then have a subfolder for each individual within my family. So my strategy for how I do that will differ depending on how many people are in my family, depending on maybe how, how much I'm actually going to be filing, depending on a lot of things. Same thing goes if you're filing on your desktop. You can decide if you're, let's say, in, if you were in sales, you might have a different folder for each customer that you're handling. But if you're in something that's more product related, you probably have folders by product first, and then you narrow it down into customers, let's say. So really your taxonomy is just a filing strategy and it's the spreadsheet that you pull together that lists what your top level is and what the subcategories under that are, what the subcategories or the sub subcategories are, and so on. So the taxonomy describes a product domain and subtopics. Now you might have many domains, you might have just one domain, but you you within your product, you definitely want to have each product listed and then all of the subtopics under those products. It's important to note that while the taxonomy we're talking about can certainly support smart navigation, we're not just talking about a web taxonomy. So if you talk to marketing folks, marketing folks typically think taxonomy equals how I navigate on my website. And that's partially true. Yes, you need a taxonomy in order to understand how people navigate on your website. The taxonomy we're talking about here will probably be much bigger and much more complex than that. And lastly, a taxonomy enables classification. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So if the taxonomy is the filing strategy, the spreadsheet that lays out all of the different terms in the right hierarchical order, the classification is the actual categorization of your content into those files, into that strategy. 
So in essence, you can think of it as labeling your content, sort of like sticking a label on a book. In this case, you might have more than one label on a book. It's not like a library book where you have one label and it gives you all the information. It could be you have 10 labels. You could have 150 labels on each of these books. But it's the actual sticking the label on the content. And for us, we typically do this using metadata. Classification can be done within the actual content resource, but oftentimes it's actually done outside the resource. It could be done in a content management system. It could be done in your delivery system. It doesn't necessarily require that you change the actual content. If you're doing structured content and you're using conditionalization, obviously you have to change the content to some degree in XML. But if you are labeling, um, the publish date, let's say, your delivery platform might just automatically add that to it. So it doesn't require that you change the content. And in many cases, it doesn't even require that you own the content. So that's important to note. So how do we develop a content taxonomy? First thing I need to say is you have to do the work. You have to dive in and put in a lot of effort. There is no easy button. If anyone comes up with an easy button, please let me know. Um, there are certainly easier ways to do it using machine learning and whatnot, but for most of us, it's just a matter of opening a spreadsheet and starting. So I'm gonna go through a very, very, very high level of how you might develop a taxonomy. I will be the first to say that there are probably better people out there to talk about how to go through the nuts and bolts of this. And I know a number of people in the industry that do wonderful workshops on developing taxonomies. So if you really wanted to learn how to develop a taxonomy, contact me afterwards and I'll put you in touch with some folks in the industry that can really help. But we're gonna just talk about it from a high level here. The first thing you need to do is determine the domain and scope of content. So what content are you covering? Are you going to talk about all of the content within the entire ecosystem of your company? Or are you covering just web content, PDF content, and uh, I don't know, support content? So really understanding what content needs to be served by this taxonomy is important. As I mentioned before, the bigger the scope, the more likely you are to bring cohesion across the organization, but you also have to keep in mind that the bigger the scope, the more complexity there is within developing the taxonomy. Once you've determined the scope, you do your first draft. You'll probably try a couple different ways to, uh, to figure out what that top level should be. You'll wanna talk with your team. You'll, you won't want to do this in a vacuum. Um, definitely do your homework, but get a draft of the top level categories and then go out and get a lot of feedback. Get feedback from subject matter experts that have various perspectives. They might be people who understand the industry, people who understand the different departmental perspectives, product features, technologies, you name it. Go out there and find people that have different perspectives that can help poke holes in what you've decided as your top level categories. Then refine that top level and draft the next level. And then you go through the process again, go back and get your feedback, figure out if what you've done is right, figure out if there's something different that would actually work better, and really just continue to draft, review, and refine through all the necessary levels. So again, this is not easy work. This is a very large, complex project, but you just need to start, try not to boil the ocean, get as comprehensive as you can without making it so complex you can't start. Get started and see where you get. Once you have it, you need to validate it. So make sure that what you end up with after all this blood, sweat, and tears, make sure it meets your needs 
and it meets your users' needs. And just because you put a ton of time into it doesn't necessarily mean you got it all right. Take a really good look at it and make sure you validate it. All right, so once you have your taxonomy, then that helps you to better tag your content. Tagging your content is something that needs to happen in order for your system to recognize who it is that this content should go to. So you might have context tags, like the product it talks about, the product version it talks about, or the content type it is. You might have user tags like the role of the person who should read this content, the level of expertise of that person, or the function of that person. And again, these tags might be things that you put into your XML structured content, or it might be things that you ask your system to do automatically. One of the best ways I know how to really pinpoint who deserves what content, who should have what content, is to do scenarios. And this is in the form of, I am a blank, and I want to blank using blank. And I put the using in parentheses because it could be for or by or any preposition or gerund that it seems necessary to add the appropriate context. So let me give you a couple examples. I am a nurse at a hospital and I want to replace a filter in a respirator. So using this scenario, we know that within our taxonomy, at least we hope, that we have either a head topic or a subtopic of filters um, and that we have a topic respirator. Maybe we have a specific product that is a respirator. And so we have within our taxonomy respirator and filter, and we know that this person's role is a nurse. And so we would then make sure that we tag our content, anything that goes for a respirator and for a filter would also get tagged with the role nurse. Another example, I'm a network engineer and I want to configure a specific router in a data center. And so we would use this and make sure that this works with our taxonomy. This is one of the ways we can kind of validate our taxonomy. We want to make sure that we have content that specifically goes to the network engineer. And so maybe we have our taxonomy at the head level might say routers and the tasks within the routers, one might be configure and then the locations within those that task is data center. All right, let's see how this works in practice. So we're going back to the, the four R's. And in terms of remembering, this particular page is showing a way for your product to really understand uh, rec both recognize and remember the user and you're doing it through explicit preferences. So if you look at the middle of the page where you see search preferences, your user is actually able to select the preferences that they have. So in this case, ServiceNow's versions all are names of cities and my colleague Joe Gelb has selected London as his preference. And then next to that, he selected some products, IT service management, IT operations, and so on. And so he has self-selected these preferences, which now makes it really, really easy for your system to remember that. It's important to note that these uh, topics or domains, versions, and products, those come directly out of your taxonomy. So in this case, their taxonomy probably says top level, Madrid, London, Kingston, Jakarta, Istanbul. Next level, all of the products within Madrid, all of the products that apply in London, all of the products applicable to Kingston. So this is where your taxonomy starts driving a little bit of your navigation 
but more so driving the preferences for personalization. All right, personalized search waiting. This is a, a really, really good way to help your customers, and oftentimes they won't even notice it. So in this case, Joe has selected Kingston. Uh, if he dropped down that little carrot next to Kingston, it would have all of that London, Madrid, Kingston, Jakarta, blah, 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 it would have all of that. So he has now self-selected Kingston because he wants to specifically search within Kingston. But as he types the word range, the weighting of what's showing up below, it's, in, it's good to have, you know, just any sort of suggested search results. But in this case, these are weighted. So based on what he has chosen previously, based on what he's clicked on previously, based on what his preferences are, the, the things that are more closely related to him are gonna show up at the top. Personalized recommendations. This is uh, almost becoming a necessity now. So if you look on the right-hand side, there's two sections under support and community. And these particular sections, if they were static, they would be somewhat helpful, but not overly helpful. If instead they are dynamic and personalized to the user, then they become very helpful. So in this case, obviously we're on report ranges. So the content that surfaces there is gonna have something to do with this particular report. So you'll see under support and community that we have different topics that are somewhat related, but perhaps not exactly related to this particular report. And in this case, it's because the first one is driving off of what we're on, so it's context sensitive. And the second one and the third one is probably coming based off of the person logged in. Now, when you think about support and community coming up on a tech docs page and having recommendations of content under the support umbrella and recommendations of user generated content coming from the community within the technical documentation, that is a great way to bridge the silos to ensure that your customers are getting all of the information that they possibly can when they need it. All right, subscriptions. Subscriptions are, are a great way to really make sure that you're getting notifications and the right information to the right people. So if you, have a subscription, you wanna make sure that you have easy subscription management. If somebody subscribes to something today, it, that means it's relevant to them today. Six months from now, two years from now, it may not be relevant anymore because they've moved to a different part of your customer journey. So make sure if you have subscriptions that you have a way for them to unsubscribe. But subscriptions can be a great way to add personalization and um, make sure that people are getting the notifications that they need. And in order to have subscriptions, you need the taxonomy. So how does the taxonomy fit into there? Well, if somebody subscribes to uh, a topic of peanut butter, then you need to know what's under peanut butter. Do we have like Jif, Skippy, and on and on? Or do we have peanut butter and jelly and and other things that you can put on toast, right? So you need to understand the parent-child relationship there. And when they choose something, what are all the children to that topic that they're gonna get? And that's defined in your taxonomy. All right, the last thing I'll point out, and I kind of said it before, but I just wanna make sure that it's super clear, and that is that your taxonomy should support the content that's delivered across the entire customer journey. The ideal situation is that every piece of content a customer ever sees follows the same taxonomy. That can be very, 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 very difficult in a large organization. I totally understand that. 
but it's really important to make sure, especially with product content, that your product content follows a singular taxonomy. It's really important that it works with the support team's content, that it works with the marketing team's content, that it works with the developer content. So it's really, really important to make sure that no matter where your customer comes in, they are getting surfaced information based on where they are in their customer journey. All right, so today we talked about personalized content and how it drives business value. We said a taxonomy provides the categorization of content that will enable you to do really cool personalization for your customers. We mentioned that a single taxonomy can be the bridge between multiple groups that are creating content within your organization. And we hit on the fact that an effective taxonomy should support content delivery at all customer touch points. So with that, that is what we have. And I will turn it back over to Jesse uh, to see if there's any questions. If you have questions, feel free to enter them into the question box at the, I want to say the bottom. We don't have a question, but we do have a thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys have any additional questions, feel free to shoot me an email, megan.gilhooley at zoomandsoftware.com. If you want more details on how to create your taxonomy, again, I'm not the person to dive into details, but I know many people who can. So feel free to shoot me any uh, emails you want on that. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on by. Beautiful. Thank you for being here. A recording will be available in the slides as well. Thank you for being here. And we will see you next week. Megan, thank you. You bet. Bye, guys.